Welcome to the Nick Blevins Family Ministry Podcast. Our goal is to help you maximize your church's potential. You'll hear from top leaders in children's, student, and family ministry about the principles and practices they use. Now here's your host, Nick Blevins. Hey everybody, I hope you're doing well. Welcome to the podcast, episode 115. But before I jump into our interview for this week, I want to talk a little bit about Ministry Boost, which is the organization that some friends and I, Kenny Conley, Kevin Monahan, and I just started. And we're kind of kicking it off with a free online event, a training for anybody who serves in children's ministry, youth ministry, uh, next-gen pastors maybe, uh, like all of you who listen to this podcast, I'm sure. And it's going to happen on Thursday, August 23rd from 1 to 4 p.m. Eastern. If you can't attend live, go ahead and register because a replay will be made available. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're giving away something like over $2,000 worth of prizes, like an Orange Conference ticket for next year, a National Youth Workers Convention ticket, and an Orange Tour ticket for this year, uh, some free courses that we're going to open up in the fall. We'll give away a couple uh, free access to those courses, an iPad, almost 20 books, all of that, which is going to be a lot of fun. But what I'm most excited about are the six sessions that we're going to cover on the podcast. It was a couple years ago, maybe three years ago, when I surveyed a bunch of you and asked, what are the topics that you want to learn about most? And the top four were partnering with parents, small groups for kids and students, volunteer recruitment, and volunteer leadership development. And what I love is that we're hitting all four of those in this free online event. And then we're also adding in a session on creating a culture of students serving, which is important for student ministry and children's ministry, and aligning your next-gen team, meaning how, how can children's ministry and youth ministry uh, play together, be part of one comprehensive strategy? So I'm excited for those six sessions. We're also going to give away a bunch of other stuff on the podcast that you don't want to miss. We have some folks who are recording videos, short little five-minute videos, talking about what are the top three boosts, the top three things that have really helped them in their area of ministry. And so you know they'll be categorized by preschool ministry, or maybe it's partnering with parents, or balancing family and ministry or high school or whatever it might be. We have a lot of leaders recording those and some of them have already happened and I'm excited to share those with you, but that's all happening on Thursday, August 23rd, 1 to 4 PM. You can sign up at ministryboost.org. I hope you'll sign up. Hope we'll see you on that live webinar, but enough of that. Let's get to my interview for this week, which is with Calla Parker and Calla and I talk about a complete strategy for student mission trips. And you would not believe uh, how comprehensive and how thought out and just how how strong the strategy is that Calla has helped create at her church. And she works with adult mission trips, but she also helps uh, the student ministry with their mission trips. They kind of use the similar strategy. And so we walk through that. What is that strategy? What are all the pieces? How does it um, work? All of it. And you'll be, uh, I think, if you serve in student ministry, you're going to love this episode because you can take some of that and apply it to your ministry. Maybe you do trips and you're going to improve them. Maybe you're wanting to start that or something like that. This will be really helpful for you. So let's go ahead now and jump into my interview with Calla Parker about a complete strategy for student mission trips. Well, I'm talking with Calla Parker today. Welcome to the podcast, Calla. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You bet. Before we jump in and and talk about mission trips and student ministry and, and how that all works together and how it works uniquely at your church, tell us about you, yourself, and your church a little bit. We've had... Uh, Kenny Conley on the podcast a while back, and so it's the same church, but just give us a, a little bit of information about you and, and your church. Yeah, so I work at Gateway Church in Austin, Texas. Uh, we're one church with three campuses in the city, um, and we're passionate about helping unchurched people um, come to know Jesus and learn what it looks like to not just walk with him, but help other people learn to walk with him as well. So I've been on staff for about five and a half years um, in the role of global director, so I get to oversee all of the um, things that we do reaching outside of our walls on a Sunday morning. So all of the work that we do around the world, but then also all the work that we do in serving our city. Um, But before that, I was on staff at a church up in Chicago area and was a youth director up there. Um, Have a really um, strong passion for students and kids. Um, My husband was a student pastor for a really long time as well. So um, just love, love the next generation. Yep. And we're going to talk about like how mission trips can work with next gen and how it works there. Yeah. Uh, because that, I think it's a little bit, I think a lot of churches probably do this, but not 
not most. I don't hear a lot where they, there's some good teamwork there and there's some good overlap between ministries. So yeah. I, and I think this will be helpful for anybody who leads trips, you know, middle school, high school. So I'd, I'd love to start with um, what is the timeline like if you're planning a trip? Now, you you do it, again, for like church-wide, so you're leading, you're helping lead trips for adults, but also for Correct. students yeah. and next-gen. And may, I don't know, maybe it's the same timeline, but what's the timeline look like for launching and leading a next gen, like a high yeah. school or a middle school mission trip? Yeah. So one of the things that I love um, specifically about Gateway and how we function is all of our teams, no matter what demographic we're focused on um, or what type of affinity team it is, uh, they all run the same. Um, our adult teams run. So the process is the same for all of our teams, um, which makes the experience, no matter where you're at in life or in getting engaged at our church, the process is the same. So you know what to expect. But um, what we do specifically with our next gen teams is we actually run we run them um, really as a movement. So we have a lot of teams that run at the same time, um, and that process actually starts at our uh, winter camp, which takes place in January. So that um, all throughout the fall, our next gen team is promoting and working for winter camp, and then on the last day of winter camp, actually unroll um, and launch all the different teams that we'll be sending in the summer. Um, and that's worked really well for them, just in terms of excitement. Um, the students and kids always look forward to that to the last day to see what's next. And then they have something to keep them engaged once they get back home, something that they're looking forward to. Um, so we launch the different locations in January, and then we actually um, have an application process that we run. And so kids and students will apply. Um, we have about three months or so from mid-January to mid-March. So right around spring break, we try to hit them um, kind of right after spring break, break is done um, so that they can have that week off if they want to do their application. Uh, but they'll apply, so we'll be promoting, um, working with our Marcom department in different areas to uh, make sure that kids and students and parents know what's available for them. Um, and then once the application date ends, we actually take the next two weeks and I get with the different next-gen teams and we process all of those applications. Um, so we uh, maybe are a little unique in that students apply for different teams. Um, this past year, we sent nine different student teams to different places. Um, and we don't always have students go on their top pick location. We actually say, hey, pick your top three locations that you want to go to. Uh, and then we assign them to the team that we feel like will be the best fit for them, dependent on their spiritual journey, who the team leaders are, what other team members are, what they're going to be doing when they're on field. Um, so we take those first two, like last week in March, first week in April, to assign people to their teams and to communicate uh, where people will be going uh, on their team. And then from um, late March, early April through May, we have what we call pre-field trainings. Uh, so our teams meet three to four times uh, for a couple hours on a Sunday to do some training content to get prepared to go. Uh, and then we have in June, our teams get sent. Um, we have a sending Sunday. They get prayed over in main service on all of our campuses. Um, and then in early June, right after school, all the teams run. They're all on field. They're all out serving. Um, and then when they get back really quickly after that, um, our last big thing all together is what we call our celebration service. Um, and that happens usually mid June. Um, so the whole process is actually about six months, um, for us on the back end of as soon as they launch to when they're back and we're done and we've closed out the budgets and the books. Um, for the participant, it really is, um, their, their commitment is from about, um, March through June with those trainings and then uh, going through the being on field and then celebrating. Cool. I want to dive into each of those areas, but before I do, just a couple quick logistical questions. I'm guessing, obviously, these trips span multiple weeks. So when kids sign up, is part of it too? They're just picking what weeks they know they can do. Uh, yeah. You know, if their family's going to be Absolutely. away, like they don't pick that one. Correct. Um, yep. So we have a place okay. to say, like, is there anything that you need to know, or why did you choose these different teams? And they say, well, I'm only available for this week or that week, um, and then. As things happen, you know, students or kids will get placed on teams and their parents call in and say, hey, like, we can't do that one. I got cheer camp. Um, and we're saying, it's great. No problem. We'll switch you to a different one. Um, so it's very much it's a big puzzle piece for those couple weeks. Um, but it all usually ends up working out really well. Um, we do have some people that end up dropping because they aren't it, either they don't like the place that they've gotten um, or they end up having a conflict. Um, and we understand that that happens. And what we found, actually, that's a great way to um, just walk with them and help them say like, well, why do you not want to serve if you're not going to go to this one place that you want to go? Um, and it's actually a really great spiritual journey for them of processing through their motives for wanting to serve and God's bigger picture and their role in that. Um, 
So it ends up actually usually working out really well. Yep. And these are all next gen trips, like a hundred percent. So the, the ones that we run with next gen, yep. Our, um, our kids and students ones run from January, but that process runs January to June. Gotcha. So we have they're teams, like, we have adult teams and family teams that run throughout the rest of the year. Yeah. They're not mixed. Um, Correct. like adult student trips. No. Yeah. These are cool. solely students. So the teams are made up of students and then we have adult leaders and then we have one team leader that's responsible for everybody. And they work with their adult leadership team to make sure that all the students are taken care of, but they're the, the primary person that makes decisions at the end of the day when they're on field. Well, that is a good lead into the next question. Cause I wanted to ask what does team leader development look like? You know, yeah. like how do you prepare them? How does this, someone, how does someone become a team leader? Yep. Um, so I found, so I've been running teams and sending people for, um, this is my 11th year mobilizing people on short term teams. Um, and what I found is that teams are uh, made and broken by their leadership. And so I'm, um, maybe too cautious in people that I send because I've seen it gone really wrong. Um, but, uh, the process that we have for our team leaders, we say, Hey, like you can't just be passionate about students, which being passionate about students is a big, you know, Plus, when you're doing next-gen teams, um, can't just have great leadership skills. Um, but we also want to make sure that you have um, the right missiology so that you understand um, accurately like what God's uh, desire for the world is and what our place that looks like and how do you lead people to participate in that well. Um, so we take them through missiological training, um, diving deeper into biblical basis for missions and culture and worldview and poverty and brokenness. And um, we also work with them on crisis management um, you know, how do you handle things when they happen on field um, with adult leaders when there's issues that happen with students when there's issues that happen? Um, we really press into them on spiritual maturity. Um, so we make sure that they're not just serving uh, internationally or on our short term teams, but they're serving and leading um, locally as well on a regular basis. Um, and then we also really want to make sure that our team leaders are um, very cross-culturally sensitive because they'll be leading their team to do that. Um, and so we actually, before any of our team leaders lead on their own, we actually go with them on field somewhere um, and watch them and do on-field coaching. Um, and so our, we have actually a team leader development process um, that for every person will take a different amount of time because um, everybody comes into it at a different place. Some of our team leaders were former missionaries that, you know, lived um in, in different cultures for 10, you know, 15 plus years. And so for them, a lot of it's just, Hey, like this is how things run here. So let's get you on board with how things run here. Um, other people just have a really strong passion for serving and for kids and students. And they want to lead in that way. Um, and so we'll take a little bit longer with them, um, have them read articles, watch some different uh, videos, read a couple books. Um, you know, we have a, almost like a mini perspectives class that we offer at our church, a four week class on missions that we'll have them go through or have them go through a um, how to share your faith class. Um, Cause they'll, because they'll be leading our team to do all of these things. We want to make sure that they, that they more than anybody else in the team have a really deep understanding of what those concepts are. Um, and so we, yeah. So, uh, you said there's a four week class. I'm trying to, th- I'm thinking through like how, how does you, do you actually train them? And it sounds like you've got this yeah. four week class. Some of it sounds like it's more individualized. Is it like, um, Hey, you read this or watch this or, or whatever, or is it pretty much a, um, a curriculum for lack of a better like term? A that everybody yeah. So we have, um, I would say a couple of the things that we have people go through right now, it is very individualized. Um, we've been working to develop almost like a cohort or like a, a track to take some people through to, to maximize the number of people that we're able to develop at one time. Um, for a while, because of the number of teams that we're sending, a lot of our team leaders were staff. And so it was easier easier to just meet with them in their staff meetings. And so it's say with the next gen staff saying, hey, like you guys all read through this and I'll come into your meeting um, and we'll talk about it and make sure that everybody's on the same page. Um, but as we're developing our people uh, and bringing more volunteer leaders in, um, a lot of it is saying, Hey, like read this book. And then you tell me when you're done with it. And then we'll get together on a Sunday after service. And you tell me your highlights and I'll ask you a couple questions about it. Um, and then we'll move on to the next thing. Um, and then as we've developed more team leaders, we've been able to have those team leaders take new leaders through it as well. Those materials. Um, so some of it is structured with classes at our church. Some of it is one-on-one more mentoring, um, or discipleship. Some of it's on your own, you know, fill out this, um, we do personality tests with them and strength finders. 
Um, so, you know, do those things and then we'll meet and we'll walk through not just what, how are these your strengths, but how are these going to really help you on field and leading? How might these hinder you on field and leading if you're not really aware of them? Uh, those sorts of things. That, that's great. That sounds really in depth. And it's like kind of there's like an overall plan, but obviously you customize it too for individuals, yeah. which is really yeah. Cool. yeah. How about so like so that's the the team leader. Then how do you prepare teams? You mentioned pre field trainings or some of that. So tell us about what it looks like from you know kids have applied, they've been probably placed, and which trip they're going on, and then what is the, what are the two or three months look like then from when they're placed to when they actually go on the trip. Yeah, so sending our teams prepared is a really high value for us. Uh, we find that the teams uh, that are prepared the most are the most effective when they get on field. And a lot of times people will focus just on getting teams together for the sake of camaraderie or bonding, um, which has great value. And so we make sure that all of the times that our teams get together, uh, they have some sort of team building time that happens. Um, but we also want to make sure that we're educating um, and using the space that we do have to be really intentional to helping them grow um, and be very prepared for what they're going to see and experience so that the team can be the most effective and not actually do more harm than good in their hopes of serving. Um, so when students apply and get placed onto a team, um, they then have their first training. So with our next gen team specifically, we do three trainings. Um, all of them are for two hours on a Sunday right before our um, student program that happens in the evening. We find uh, we've played around with a couple different times of doing them, but we found that actually Sunday afternoons is the most unscheduled time for a student um, and putting it right before the program. Um, if we provide just a little snack in between, like a pop, you know, ice cream bar or something like that, um, it'll actually allows them to stay um, and engage with the youth group um, that's happening. So for those three different Sundays, um, on the very first one, when we do the launch, um, all of the teams go to their separate team. They all happen at the same time, um, but all the teams will meet in different rooms and they'll go through training material led by the team leader. So we equip the team leader with um, a training agenda and overview of what's to happen and then leader guides for all of the different topics that they'll cover and then ha the appropriate handouts. Um, but we say to the team leaders, hey, this is the um, the you know, the guardrails are the things that we want to make sure are covered. The way that you present this stuff is up to you because everybody has a different leadership style. So every team training will look a little bit different depending on who the leader is. But at that first training, we talk through all the logistics of how do we go and why we go. So we cover that biblical basis for missions. Um, and then the specifics of the forms that they need, um, how to raise support, how to build a sending team, um, what's due when, the commitments, all of those sorts of things. Um, and at the very same time that we're having the student trainings, um, we actually do a specific parent training or orientation um, with all of the parents that are involved in any team um, in a separate space. So each of the teams are meeting separately, but then all the parents for all of the teams are together. And we actually walk through all of the logistics with them as well and say, hey, this is the management platform that we're going to be using. Here's how you access it. Here's how you figure out what trainings are coming up next. Here's how we're going to communicate to you. Um, here's when things are due. Here's um, who your kid's team leader is and how what you can expect from them in terms of communication. Um, here's how you get a hold of us if you have any questions on things. Um, and we make sure that they're all on the same page as well with everything. Um, and then if we have international teams going, we have separate uh, information for international teams, parents, that sort of thing. Um, so that first training is the only one that we require parents to be at. Um, and we have found that um, no matter how many times a student has done a team, it's still very important for the parents to be at that team meeting because um, you'd be shocked at how much information parents forget in a year or maybe not shocked at how much information they forget. Yeah. Uh, but we do require that um, any every parent comes to that. Um, and that what's really great with that, though, is it actually allows the next gen um, to have a really strong presence and voice with parents and say, hey, um, we love your students and we love their development so much that we want to invest in them in this way. And we want to partner with you in this way. And we want to help shape and change their worldview. Um, and that parent meeting, even though it is really informational, um, really has become a strong catalyst for our next gen staff um, to tell parents how much they value their students and how much they care about seeing them grow um, and become, you know, change, world changers. Um, so that's been a really fun thing to see. Um, and then for the next two trainings after that, parents aren't um, supposed to come to any of those, uh, but we have um, team trainings again, separate where we give the team leaders 
training guides and handouts and all of those things. And they execute two different trainings. One, they do um, culture and worldview and then dive in specifically to the culture that they'll be serving in. Um, and these are really big picture concepts. We say, hey, there's so much that we can go into when we think about training and preparing to go. But what we want to do is provide a really great foundation that you guys can build upon when you're on field. So we want to present enough information um, that we have um, things to then go talk deeper in um, when you're actually within the culture. Um, so our team that went to Haiti, you know, we talked in depth about uh, Haitian culture and what to expect and um, what not to do, but not just what not to do, but why would you not do that because of what the Haitians have as their worldview, um, those sorts of things. Um, and then at our last training, we talked about poverty and brokenness, um, specifically what is poverty and how do we define it? How does the rest of the world define it? Um, actually, you know, if poverty is actually broken relationship um, then where might you yourself experience a broken relationship and where does God need to heal you before you can look at healing other people? Um, and then woven throughout those last two trainings, we actually also have students um, craft their testimony or their faith story. Um, and then we have them walk through how to articulate the gospel. Um, I have really found, so being a youth director and then non-missions director, uh, I really found that these short-term teams, um, that that space is one of the best spaces to actually present the gospel to students um, and help them grasp it and understand it and learn it and learn how to articulate it properly. Um, Cause they have a purpose for it. They have a, something that a goal that they're working towards. Um, and as they do that, as they learn how to do that, many of them find for themselves that they actually have never accepted or believed the gospel for myself. And I want this to count for me. And I'm, I'm learning this to share it with others, but this is the first time that I'm actually really understanding it. Um, and that's been really, really fun to see. Um, and we actually use a lot of stuff, um, from, uh, crew has campus crusade, uh, has a, an app called thrive studies. Um, and there's some really great little studies that we use to help that are student specific, um, that we use for kind of faith stories and articulating the gospel. That's great. That, that time leading up to you know, the trip and the preparation and all the things you're teaching them obviously is very helpful in their journey. Um, I'm wondering as you, cause you mentioned a couple of things I want to ask about in this kind of in this phase in the parent meeting, you mentioned uh, a management platform you use. What platform yeah. do you use to manage trips? And I'm saying, I'm assuming it's one for signups and registration and all of that. Yeah. So right now we use something called managed missions and it works, um, for everything from the application to uh, managing trainings that are coming up to processing support, uh, you know, funds that are coming through uh, to housing all documents that might be pertinent. Um, actually, it will also connect you to, you know, travel agent and print travel documents for you. Um, and there's uh, for that, we just pay a monthly fee to managed missions. Um, there's another one that we've been looking at shifting to called Focus Mission, which actually integrates with Ministry Platform, which is the database our church uses. Um, and so we'll probably end up shifting to that just for that integration. Um, cause right now the managed missions is completely separate from, um, everything else that our church operates out of. Yep. And we didn't even talk about this beforehand, but I'll, I'll and churches are very different in how they approach this, but how, uh, do you all approach kids paying for trips? Do they fundraise? Is it all on them? Do you help pay for any of it? Is it, do you help them do fundraisers? Like what does that look like when they're trying to raise money for yeah. trips? Yeah. So in the same way that we have a strong value center, our team's prepared. We also have the value of sending our team sent. Um, so we ask everybody to build a sending team. Um, that might just be a prayer sending team if they want to pay for their experience themselves. But more often than not, that also ends up being a um, financial support sending team. Um, and so we really encourage everybody and ask everybody to invite individual people to be part of sending them. Um, so we... We do ask everybody to pay um, a deposit, uh, just saying that's them saying, hey, yes, I'm committed to this. I'm all in. That helps us to plan and reserve transportation and know what our team sizes are going to be. And also helps them say, yes, like I'm leading out, even as I'm asking others to participate with me. Um, we do not do fundraising um, or team fundraising. If team members want to do that on their own or supplement building a spend team, um, they're totally free to do that. Um, but we found that focusing on one specific, um, m one specific method for raising support um, and keeping people focused on that um, helps us uh, really 
stay focused. Um, so anytime somebody comes say, hey, I cannot pay that deposit, it's just way above what um, you know we're able to pay. Our, and our deposits range, depending on what the team is, anywhere from 50 bucks to $300. Um, anytime somebody comes and says, hey, like we can't do that at all, we say, no problem, don't worry about it, what can you pay? Um, is that $25? Is it 50? Um, let us know what you can pay. because we want to hold to that value um, and have you live out that value of going invested. But we never want uh, money or resources or lack of resources to be something that keeps you from engaging in the Great Commission and what God's calling you to do. Um, so team members do sign a team agreement and they bring that to their first training. And that says, yes, I understand that I am ultimately responsible for any funds that the church pays on be- out on behalf of me. And I'm, I am responsible for that total amount. Um, But what we do say is, hey, um, as you're following the process that we're asking of you of building a support team, uh, we'll work with you as you work with us. And so many times we'll have team members that raise more money than they need for their team. And we're able to use that to offset team member costs. Um, Or we have teams that raise way more than they need. And we're able to use that to offset team costs from other teams. Um, Or we say, hey, um, you know what, we actually have a little bit of surplus. Um, and so we're, you know, we won't ask you to cover that amount. Either our expenses weren't as much as we anticipated. And so don't worry about that. Um, or, um, you know, we had a donor that ended up giving randomly. Um, and so we were able to give them an anonymous donation in that way. Um, so we do hold people responsible for their total cost. Um, but we try to work with them as much as we can um, as they communicate with us. I would say that's one thing that we stress is a lot of times people won't say anything. Um, and then they'll want to drop out right away. They're like, oh, well, you know, money's, we don't have the money for it. Um, so that's, that's not really how it works, but we want to work with you and want to see God show up and provide for you. Um, and I would actually say um, that the ways that I've seen God show up for people financially before they get on field um, actually has, has bigger, they grow more in that season that, than, with, than with what they experience when they're serving. Um, and so it's actually been really neat to see that whole process of leading up to somebody going, um, and then inviting other people and trusting God to show up, um, just so that how the Lord uses that to grow and develop them. Um, it's just really fun. Yeah. So stress, stressful. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. Uh, yeah, that's, that's familiar when they get on field. I mean, obviously a lot of people, anybody listening that has led trips or been on trips understands what that looks, looks like and then how it's different in terms of the, where you go and what the work you're doing yeah. and all that. But what is what does the team time look like for you all? You know, that's probably unique to you. What is, what does that team time look like together? How are you preparing leaders for that? Um, walk us through that a little bit. Yeah. So in addition to the different serving that students do, um, we ask all of our team members to make sure that two things happen. One is that team members, individuals have personal time or devotional time. Um, if they're able to do that every day, that's ideal. If that's every other day, then that's great depending on the schedule. But we really want to make sure that students are learning what it looks like to spend time alone with God, to journal, to study, um, to be in scripture. Again, um, we use some of the, devo- there's some devotionals on the Thrive Studies app. Um, that crew puts out that we use that are really great. Um, and so we make sure that there's devotional time that happens. And sometimes our ministry partners um, have devotionals available. So we'll do those. But then usually in the evening, um, we ask our team leaders to make sure that they're doing debrief time uh, with their students. Um, we, tr- we encourage them to do it every day, uh, again, if they're able. Um, and that team time really is twofold. Um, we want them to be able to debrief their day. So really reflect and look back and say, um, you know, who impacted me? Uh, what were the things that challenged me today? Um, how did I see God move and work around me? Um, what were some cultural differences that were stressful or what were some things that I did that were uncomfortable? Or how did I see myself grow? Help, help them process what they've experienced. Um, but then we also really ask our team leaders to use that time as a time for spiritual formation. Um, there is no other um, amount of time that you get this much time with a student to really invest into them and this much quality time with a small group of students. Um, I've been a small group leader um, and I'm currently a small group leader with 12th grade girls. Um, And even with that of, you know, being really intentional with them, there's nothing like being with a small group of students in a different culture context for a week um, that really allows you just to focus on some different things. And so we ask our team leaders, Hey, in addition to debriefing, to really reflecting and helping them process, um, really focus in on um, different 
spiritual formation topics, like teach them how to pray. Um, here's some different prayer exercises to walk through with them that would be transferable for when they get home. Um, teach them what it looks like to study the Bible or the, uh, how to memorize scripture. Pick a memory verse for the week and really focus your team on that verse and refer to it and reflect on it. Um, do act, like Thanksgiving activities and um, help them to be mindful. Again, walk them through some of these different things um, that they can experience there, but then they can transfer back when they're back in their routine life so that they, it's not just this event, this thing that happened, but it can help them as they get back home. Um, and we do our best to equip team leaders with a bunch of those resources um, before they go. Um, and then a lot of team leaders will just have different things that they've done on their own or experience that they will implement um, when they're there. But a lot of times, um, again, in the same way that teams can be made or broken by their team leader, a lot of times the, um, the growth that will happen in a student can be really can be dependent on if those team times are fruitful and focused or if they're just kind of a more social hangout. Um, and the tendency usually can be to have them just be kind of a hangout time or even, again, just a team connection time. Um, when really we've, we, I've seen over, you know, the last 10 years, so the real growth happens as you're very intentional to lead students to grow and really be, um, take advantage of that space. Yeah. And I love how you're, you're, um, and what we'll talk about here in a second is what it looks like when it comes back. But I love how there's a, a, an approach where it's, you're not just looking at like the trip, it's what's before it, how they're going to be developed before the trip, on the trip, after the trip. Uh, cause that is a tendency sometimes with certain trips yeah. is, you know, it's the mountaintop experience and then there's always peaks and valleys, but you want some measure of change to stay, right? You're not yeah. always going to be on the mountaintop, yeah. but you still want, you know, that to impact their life in a way that sticks with them. And I like that you do a, a celebration service. And so that obviously that's at the end after all the trips have gone. So you're scheduling that later in summer. What does that look like? Yeah. So when all the teams get back, um, we have a big celebration service where they all come back together. So it's depending on the church that I've been at or um, the year, it's actually looked a little bit different. Um, but typically the three big components to it um, are um, we have a time where teams look, they reflect backwards. Um, so we have pictures that are shared. We have uh, videos that are shared. We always have worship. Um, so we have either the band from church, we contract out a band if we need to. Um, to come in and so we have a time of worship to celebrate um, and to sing. Um, and then we usually have stories. Um, so we try to pre-pick or talk with team leaders, say, hey, who had great life change um, on your team? Who really showed up? Who has an amazing story of how God is working and how they partnered with him? Um, would you prep them to share it? And we'll either share that by filming them and then sharing it, or we'll have them come on stage. Um, this past year, we actually did um, an open mic where we had like two students that were pre uh, prepared to share and they shared on stage. Then we just did open mic for any participant that wanted to come share. And that was really fun. Um, we got some real interesting things, but um, as you do with any open mic, um, but it was really fun to see some of the real littles come up and share about what God was doing. Um, so I always reflect back to celebrate. So pictures, videos, worship stories. Um, we always try to make sure that it's God focused, um, which sounds um you know, kind of simple and like, well, of course it would be God focused, but it can be really easy with teams and specifically with celebration services to talk about how all the things our team did. Um, so we really try to be very specific with the language that we use to highlight, you know, God is moving around the world and we're going to celebrate how we have partnered in his movement and how we've seen him show up. Um, so we always make sure that we are really specific um, to have that language um, of you know, joining God in his movement. Um, and then we always take time to look ahead and ask that question, what's next? Um, because like you said, it so often um, teams and, and trips, mission trips are just about that week on field. Everything builds up to that week. And it's almost like, um, a, you know, a wedding ceremony, all the work happens for the wedding. Like, oh my gosh, I'm married now. Like, what do we do? Um, this, I see the same thing that happens with uh, mission trips is you do all this work to go and then you come back and it's like, well, what do we do now? What do we do with this? Um, and so we, we try our very best to say, hey, here are some really great ways to present team members with some really great ways to plug in now that they're back. Um, we say, hey, you know, what did you experience when you were on field that you need to transfer back into your, into your routine life here? 
Um, did you connect with God in a way that you hadn't before? Do you, so do you need to start, uh, do a devotional? Here's a really great, here's some really great devotional options. Or maybe you just made a decision to follow Jesus. Here's a baptism class that's coming that we can walk you through what that decision means and the next step that you can take. Maybe you served it with your giftings in a way that you had never served before. Um, here are some really great ways to serve on campus every Sunday, or here are some really great ways to serve in our city um, on a regular basis. You know, you worked with a uh, homeless population and when you're on your team. Well, we have, um, you know, this network that's serving in our city, the homeless population, you can join them on a weekly basis. So get your parents to go with you and invite your friends to go with you and do that. Um, we really stress, um, you know, don't let that week be an event in your life. Um, please, please let it be a catalyst to future ways that God wants to work in and through you. Um, and so depending on where students are at, they'll take, some of them will take steps. Uh, some of them won't. And we know that, um, but we want to make sure that we're doing our due diligence to keep that in front of them and to present options for them. Um, I think one of the most challenging things is to present those options. Um, so it can be hard to think about and to get ahead of um, of the teams when you really are trying to do all the work to get teams on field. Um, but it's so worth it having those options available for students. Um, I'd say that we've seen our student serving, like our student participation and serving on Sundays triple um, over the course of the couple of years of doing teams since we started doing Go Teams at Gateway. Um, and that's just been... I, I'm just, so exciting to see that students really engaging in the church in that way. That's awesome. Yeah. Do you, I mean, you have, you may have no idea, but do you have any idea even offhand of what percentage of students go on trips in a year? You know, like over, yeah. across multiple years, it's obviously a higher percentage, but in one year, do you send 10%? Yeah. So on we third, have, you know? no, yeah. So we have, um, I would say this. So this past year we sent, probably 120 students, middle school and high school, maybe 100, 120, 140, I'm sorry, 144 students. Um, and I would say active, um, there's probably about 250 really active um, students um, overall that are part of Gateway. So I'd say it's, wow. that we have a really significant number of students that participate in our teams um, and then a lot of those actually um, are consistent in serving on Sunday, even if they're not able to always make it to the youth program, um, which I know is you know, a whole nother conversation. But um, a lot of them have maintained being really active um, in that way, which is fun to see. So, yeah, that's great. I and mean, that sounds like over half. That's, that's pretty yeah. high. Yeah. From, you know, and we've really the seen that, uh, that the teams uh, – are really great on board for students that might not engage other words uh, otherwise. Uh, so we have, I have a small group leader or we have a small group leader right now that leads our eighth grade girls. And her first touch point into gateway and into gateway students was actually on by going on a go team herself. when she was a junior in high school. Um, and then she ended up going, getting plugged in, finding community, um, becoming a Christ follower, um, you know, getting discipled. And then, you know, five or six years later, she's, um, leading other students and now an adult leader on one of our teams. Um, and that was just because she decided she wanted to go. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, that's great. How, how can that, let's wrap up with this. You've, you know, spent time in student ministry. Like you said, your husband has been a student pastor for a long time and, and you've been in the missions world, you know, church wide, how can yeah. missions departments and next gen work better together? Kind of the way you do there. Yeah. So I would say that, um, most likely, if you're at a church and you're in youth ministry, you run all the teams yourself um, or the missions department runs all the teams themselves and you just promote them for them or you shift students to them. Um, but truly is a beautiful thing um, when missions teams and next gen teams are able to collaborate. Um, and so I would encourage anybody <laughs> to really pursue that. Um, and it really is that word. Um, I think the two words that I think of is is collaborate, but then also alignment. Um, thinking, you know, what are the what are the big picture things that our church is already engaged in, um, and how can our students? How can we focus and look at uh, engaging our students in those things that our church is already doing, so that when they get back, they understand how they fit in the bigger picture of our church and our context. Um, so I'd say, if you're a student pastor or a kids pastor, ask your missions department. Um, and that's how I started. I was youth director in Chicago and. Um, 
we're in the mix uh, of a big uh, like building shift and a move um, and nobody wanted to do the missions part of the student stuff for our team. So I was like, well, I'm really passionate about it. So I'll do it. And then as I started kind of taking on and doing it, I was like, oh my gosh, I have like no idea. Like I know how to run a, a trip or a team or I've done them, but I don't know how to do it really well. And so I went to our missions department. And I said, hey, would you guys teach me how you guys run stuff and could we align and run things the way that you do is so that it's streamlined. Um, and they were more than happy uh, to do that. Um, but it did take me taking that initiative. Um, and then it also took me saying, Hey, like, I understand I have ideas about how I want to do things, but you guys do have a process about things have running and they're running really well. So I'm going to, um, die to those, you know, to my desires, um, and say like, yeah, like we'll do things this way. Um, so it truly is going to need an openness to collaborate and teamwork and to have things not maybe go the fully the way that you want. Um, but it's such, has such great, um, payoffs for sure. Um, I think, so if you're a student pastor, um, or in that, ask your missions department, um, if they'd be willing to collaborate in some way, in any way, um, even if it would be, Hey, like, what are the different training things that you guys walk your teams through that I could take from you and adapt to be student friendly? Um, you know, it's not asking them to do more work, um, but, but saying, Hey, the work that you guys have already done, um, how can I take that and use that so that my teams are, are much more prepared? Um, or if you guys, you know, if they're, if you're in a missions, um, in a missions role and you're just completely disconnected from the uh, next gen and from students, approach them and, and saying, Hey, how can we serve you? Um, that would be a huge win for them. Um, you know, you mentioned Kenny Conley earlier and I went to him, um, when we first started working at Gateway, um, said, Hey, like I'd really love to mobilize kids and students to see, um, see great value in that and just totally saw it as well. I said, Hey, like, what can I do for you? Um, how can I help you with this? Cause then you guys have a lot happening. What can I take off of you? What are you comfortable letting me do? Um, and that was a lot of conversation, a lot of miscommunication, a lot of back and forth, um, a lot of, Hey, I'm really sorry. I overstepped there. I don't know what I'm doing here. Um, but in the end working through a lot of those kinks, um, it's been so worth it. Um, and I'd say we're still working through some of those kinks. We've had, um, you know, leadership transition at the church that I'm at and new people in roles with next gen. And so, um, we've been relooking at everything and saying, Hey, like the process of when we run, is that really the most effective? Is it the best? Let's have a conversation around it. Is it fitting the greater vision that you have for your student ministry? Um, and if it's not, then we want to, we want to keep the integrity of how we run things, but we're willing to shift these other things so that it really is a benefit for you. And it really fits the bigger picture of what you're trying to accomplish with your students. Um, and so willingness to collaborate and openness, um, to not be in control of all things, um, and to have, and to change, um, and say probably those two key things, but mm-hmm. yes, it is really rare, sadly. Yeah. And well, it's messy, like you said, but then it's yeah. really good. You know, yeah, so it might be it messy early on, but it ends up really good. Speaking yeah. of Kenny, he basically, Kenny literally said you, uh, in term, when it comes to mission trips for kids and teens, that you might be the smartest person in the planet. So thanks for <laughs> really sharing generous. that wisdom um, with us. That's hilarious. I appreciate that. How can people connect yeah. with you if they have any questions? Yeah, I'd say email is the best way. Um, and I can shoot my email to you uh, if you want. That's kala.parker uh, at gmail.com. Um, and I love I love to collaborate. Um, I did with Kenny recently as well for his teams. Um, so he's at a different church now in Arizona. I was able to call and work with him um, and send him a lot of different materials and um, help them figure out a plan for what that looks like. And that is, um, that's, I love doing that. I love seeing the church and the next generation mobilized and equipped properly um, to do that. That's awesome. Well, great work you're doing there. That's an amazing system process, everything you have going, which I'm sure is bearing lots of fruit with kids and around the world and adult leaders and all that. Thanks so much for taking time to share with us what that looks like. And uh, we really appreciate you giving us the time. Yeah, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Well, I think it's easy to see why Kenny Conley said she's the best on the planet, right? I mean, that is a really strong strategy. And it's just complete, right? I mean, from the beginning, the preparation to the onboarding and the registration and the and the training on site, the follow up, all of that. Some of the action items I thought about, and I thought about this while we were having the conversation. Uh, evaluate your current strategy. What what do you do? Where is it strong? Where is it weak? Where are there pieces that are missing? And then another action step would be to create a timeline. I mean, you probably already have this if you do trips, but from scratch, think, you know, if I could start from scratch, create a new timeline, what would that look like? 
And then third, of course, develop the pieces of the timeline and start, I think, you know, we're coming to the end of summer here. So for most folks, you're not, you're, you're wrapping up mission trips. You know, if you lead students, I, you know, I know most student mission trips happen in the summer. So could you start working now to develop the pieces of your new strategy or your renewed strategy for next year? You can get all the links and notes and all those things at nickblevins.com slash episode 115. Well, as I mentioned before, I hope we'll see you online at the Ministry Boost free online event, uh, August 23rd, 1 to 4 p.m. Make sure you register at ministryboost.org. Until then, hope you have a great week, and I'll catch you next time on the Family Ministry Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Nick Blevins Family Ministry Podcast. We hope this helps you maximize your church's potential. We would love to hear stories of how you apply what you've learned. You can do that by leaving a comment on iTunes or in the show notes at nickblevins.com.